This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome back to the World of Martial Arts show. We're excited to have another episode here. Uh, as always, I am Kurt Cornwell and joined with uh, Nathan Leverton, McTully, and we've got... Uh, the man behind the curtain, Will Henshaw, keeping it down for us. We are, um, I decided we wanted to talk today a little bit about some of the differences between um, training in a martial art and maybe practicing a martial art or studying a martial art, what the different perspectives are in the different cultures of schools, perhaps schools versus gyms, uh, in the way that we approach these things. What does it mean to train uh, or study with our mates, with our, our classmates, with our uh, schoolmates, with our training partners, as it were, sparring partners? Uh, I always find it interesting that the usage of that word partners uh, myself, where, you know, when we're working with a training partner or sparring partner, there's an inherent partnership in that. We both have to be getting something out of it. Um, in the organization that Mick and I are part of, uh, MKG, we always use the expression where we train with our partners, not on our partners. And I've found that to be a really distinct thing um, that I've kept with me and that I seek out when I want to train with other people. If I feel like if I'm getting beat up during my training and that's the nature of the training, I'm OK with that. If I'm getting beat up in my training because the other guy is being unsafe, is being kind of a jerk, is being whatever, then that I have a problem with. And so I was kind of curious for you guys, some of your perspectives on what it means to be a training partner or to be maybe a teammate on a fight team, what some of these different roles are and what the cultures of your uh, respective gyms and groups really looks like in that regard. Nathan, you want to take us off? I'm, I'm actually really curious. You know, Mick and I come from some similar backgrounds, but you as a uh, as a coach of fighters and having worked in different uh, arenas than myself, what, what does that look like for you? I mean, the way it is now where it's more classes and recreational players to how it was before when it was just competitors is a little bit different. But you said, you said roles there, and that made me think. Like, if you're looking at an organization and you had – a position in that organization you talk about the roles and responsibilities so i'm thinking about like a student in my class what do i expect of them of their roles and responsibilities as a student as a person on the class and the more i think about it the more i'm thinking now that i probably expect too much of people like i'm asking people sometimes to be like a pad holder which is a skill in and of itself to maybe even like mentor or coach their training partner if their partner's not at their level i'm asking them to be a student and be a good student like be an active listener and kind of do their own study in order that kind of thing you know there's people that i expect to be demo partners which is another skill i expect people to be teammates and sparring partners which are other skills like i'm actually like they're paying me to teach them and i'm probably asking quite a lot because you said like being a training partner is that's like you have to do it with them you have to help them you have to do these things and to be good at any of these things, which we can talk about, like how to be a good demo partner, how to be a good training partner, or these different things, to be good at any of those things is that's a big ask. And a lot, not a lot of people have these skills. So my brain's currently just whirring. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to, to Mick, but I'm like, am I asking too much of people, like when they be a student in my gym? Um, do you know what? As an instructor or an owner of a school or the coach in front, uh, yeah, you are asking a hell of a lot of someone. Now, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Because it, it's a nightmare. Because if you just look at it from a personal, uh, you know, 
we'll, we'll, let's, we're all friends here. Everyone is watching this. You know the score. You've watched this long enough to know now you've got a relationship with us. Uh, we're all very, very selfish when it comes to training. Otherwise, why would you devote so much time to martial arts and this self-development thing? Uh, as Kurt was saying, he, um, when he mentioned about different roles, Nathan's brain was going, but I've already had this for years because uh, it makes me sound like a real sociopath, but a very good friend of both myself and Kurt's is a guy, I've got to give him a shout out, Mike Duffy. He's one of the coolest characters you're ever going to meet. That guy's ready for the apocalypse, by the way. So guess what? If he's your mate, you're going to be okay. Yeah, if you live near him, you're going to be okay because when when all of this is over... Duffy's going to be still there, right? But Duffy was the guy who first explained to me that he said, I have people in my life for different roles. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, look, this is going to make me sound really weird, but I, I never, never the twain shall meet. If someone's a training partner of mine or say they're a mentor of mine, then they're, if they're a mentor of mine, we can't go to bars and pick up ladies together because that, that isn't the role that they're in my life for. And I was thinking, wow. And that made me really start thinking about the training aspect because I've got certain guys that I train with. So if I wanted to do trapping or Hubert, there's literally a guy and he's brilliant. My, my friend, Paul Devlin, love training with him. But if we were going to go and do jujitsu, then I'm going to drive over and see Neil Simkin because Neil Simpkins is the guy who brings out the best in me in that. So, and that's from a personal training point of view. So then when we're in the gym, it's like you were saying, Nathan, you know, like you're getting these guys and you're trying to put roles on them. I remember the first time I give you an, like, just give you an idea how this thing is, it's out there for all of us, by the way. And it's literally, I love this uh, subject because I think it's one of these subjects that we just don't talk enough about. I remember the first time that Rick Young, the mighty Rick Young, ever asked me to demo with him. And as we were walking out, Terry Barnett said, he goes, mate, that's a big thing. And I went, what do you mean? And he went, he goes, you got to remember, it's, it's Rick Young, mate. He said, first of all, that says so much about your character that he actually trusts you to, first of all, just make him look good. But secondly, not try and have him over. You know, we have a lot of that with, uh, you know, with Guru Dan. Yeah, we, we have this whole thing when he does pro, does uh, seminars. We don't let any of the morons near him because guess what? Uh, I'm not saying Emil Bustepi was an idiot, but, you know, he made his name by fighting William Chung. You, do you understand what I'm saying here, right? So there's roles in all of this. And like and we're bringing it, trying to bring it down to a microcosm of our, of our schools and where we're in our classes. But, oh, man, I'll tell you what, a training partner, my good God, they have to have everything. And unfortunately, to have everything, you need about six of them in your life. Do you know what I mean, Nathan? Yeah, I think being a good demo partner, we all, we all pick the same people usually to, to pull out to demo. Like we know we should vary it up and use different people and that's going to give them the experience and they're going to get that boost by being called out and they're going to get to feel you do it with them as well. But we all tend to use the same people. And you said about making us look good and it is partly that, definitely. But it's also, it's the... You know, you need someone to be compliant at some moments and give you resistance at others. And you know what it's like when you pull out the person who does it the opposite way that they should. You know, the bit where you need, you're talking and you need it chilled and they just suddenly go a bit mad. And then the bit where you actually need them to give you some energy back, they kind of go all floppy and it's like, oh, this is an absolute nightmare. And sometimes you have to end up putting it on them a little bit and that kind of thing. Um, but I've always found, I've always, it's, this is something that um, Wayne Lakin, the judica who's taught our place, um, he he used to talk about a lot and he was given it by Neil Adams, the judica, a very famous judica out of this country. And he was always saying, be the best training partner you can be. Like be the person who wants to be pulled out to demo, be the person that everyone wants to train with. And I do try and express that to the students. And I do tell them, I said, look, if you're someone that people want to train with, the best guys in the room will want to train with you. If you're, if you're a good training partner, if you're not just trying to make it about you, the best people will train with you. So by being altruistic, and kind of letting them do the move and helping them and helping them get better, you you actually gain from it, um, which some people don't get at the start. Yeah, so it, everything you guys both just brought up is why I brought the subject up to you guys to begin with. I think specifically this is what it's all about. This is one of the big like uh, secrets maybe to martial art or something if you're a new person is like the, the, the less you are 
focused on your own development during class and the like the more you're aware of everything and all the other people that are in the group the better it's going to be for you mick you you bring up uh uh mike duffy duffy's actually the first person that i he and steph that were my first regular training partners and duff used to say to me um we did a lot of like technical stuff together and a lot of uh more realistic combative stuff outside of the gym together but a lot of our our martial art training was trapping infighting a lot of dagger work really really high technical stuff mike is extremely extremely strong powerful um he's on the cover of men's health magazines type of dude and he told me once he was like we had just finished a training session he was like man it's just really hard for me because sometimes i just wish i had somebody that i could really go hard with and I was like, I was all beat up and busted up from this training session with Mike. And he was like, you know, it's just, it's tough for me because I can't really find anyone to train with where I can let it out. And I was like, what the hell? Like one, no offense taken. And two, you let it out pretty good on me, man. But he's right because that showed me just how much he had in the tank, just how much he had to hold back to be a good training partner to me. And he put me in a category to go, well, then I'm Kurt likes to do this kind of stuff and, and tends to excel in this area. So I'm going to work with him on this. I'm going to work with this guy and that, this guy on that, which is really, really brilliant. Um, and I, it, when you're talking about being a good demo partner, what I remember from that experience, and I think we all can relate to this, the first time you get called up, it's such an, it's like a, it's almost like getting a belt promotion or something like that. There's, there's a, you know, there's a funny ego pride thing that happens. I remember being extremely excited about it the first time I got to demo with Rick Faye. And I know I did terribly because for me, it was like, look at how good I am at doing it, holding these pads or whatever, you know, like everyone in the room is really going to be impressed by the fact that I'm helping Rick Faye demo. Like I'm, people are watching him. They're not watching me. And that makes you not very good as a demo partner because you're occupied with your side of it. You guys know when you're teaching, you want the guy that when you're talking, he's just kind of looking at you there waiting. Right. And he's just, he's kind of, you, you don't even notice him when you're in the class until he serves his role bap, 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 and then goes back to just kind of being, you know, in the background a little bit where I know when I first started being able to demo, it was like, I want to stand right out in front. Hey, check me out. I'm the one up here doing it, you know? And so that really, to me tells us one, there are specific roles that we maybe should look at Two, a lot of being um, sought out in these contexts is because you're good at assisting other people, right? And to your initial point, Nathan, are, are you asking too much of all these people? I'm asking the same thing of all of my students. So we probably are. The, the bitch of it is that's part of the beauty. I think of what we do is the people who are like, yeah, I'm into this. I'm learning how to be a coach. I'm learning how to be a fighter. I'm learning how to be a student. I'm learning how to be a martial artist, I'm learning how to be a martial athlete. I'm learning how to teach. I'm learning, you know, all these skill sets at the same time is really unique. And I don't think if you're just playing basketball that you get to have that, that spectrum of perspective given to you. Yeah, there's so much there <laughs> like when you talked about working with someone and they were working at your level uh, we call that dialing in in our gym you dial into where the person that you're with is at whether it's it's physically or experience wise or whatever but obviously to improve again with resistance you actually need increasing resistance as well so like if you're dialing it down all the time then yeah you need someone where you have to dial it up um so you do you, you do need that in the room i think um well, can I ask you one thing in that regard yeah. when you're talking about training for fighting? <clears throat> Excuse me. My preferred method, and it's hard to jump in, Mick. I know you had something to say too, but my preferred method for sparring as somebody like I would consider myself more into martial arts than combat sports or whatever. So, and a pathway to the artistry of the thing. I like progressive sparring sessions. If we're looking at something like boxing, I want where I only get to use my jab. You get to use both hands. Then we're going to do a round where, you know, we, we switch roles. Then we're going to be at opposite leads. And then we're going to progressively take away or add things to this to make it more complex, you know, make you focus in on certain things. And when you're doing that, the person you're sparring with is undoubtedly 
helping you figure out your game because if they can use two hands you can only use one they don't feel real good if they won that sparring round you know what i mean like of course if you got two hands i can only use my jab you you should win that one and it, it eliminates some of that frankly that win aspect of it do you find when you are taking guys past that point of being cooperative and more into trying to actually push each other and they're not being supportive in that way, is there still that element of looking out for each other or is it really just about fight and win? You know what I mean? Is it about contesting each other? It definitely depends on the level of the people that are training and gotcha. the, goal, the goals. But it's funny, I did a class the other day and it was literally exactly what you were talking about. Um, but then there was a bit of a framing at the end of it. So you know, they, they did some, um, you know, three jabs each versus de defense and then their jab versus jab and then same with the teep and then jab and teep and then put in the cross on the hook and the low kick and you built it up and built it up, built it up. And then towards the end, it was like, okay, you are putting these together and then you can put the body shots in a bit harder, right? And I kind of said to them though, watch some high level guys spar, say a tie round. That whole class you just did is the first minute. You know, they probe each other with jab a little bit, probe each other with teep a little bit, throw a couple of straights and hooks, put a low kick in, then one that throws a heavier body kick, then the other one throws a heavier body kick, then one grabs the knees, and the other one grabs the knees, and then it's on. And I was like, what you just did there, that progression through the class, they'll be doing that in a super condensed first round of sparring, and then it's all on from there. So whereas before working with high-level guys, they would have done all of that, but that would have been round one of like a 10 round sparring session. I may extend that out for the whole class for the, the people that I've got at the moment. And I try and tell them that that is the difference between it. Um, I mix wanted to jump in loads of times. There's, you might have to roll back a bit to some of the stuff we were talking no, about. No, 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 no. First of all, first of all, can I just address what you said there, Nathan? Um, there is a great clip and uh, Will, if we can get it and we can like frame it up and stick it out in Woma, it would be great. Uh, there's a clip of Phil Nurse. If you haven't heard of this guy, Google him, right? In New York, unbelievable Thai boxer. Uh, he's, he, he has a gym, I believe it's called The Church and it's him against Bukar, right? And I swear to God, as like Nathan said, it was one of those it's one of those uh, experiences when you're watching it that you're just going, I have never, ever seen anything like this. And I don't think I'll ever see anything like this again, because it is that such, we used to, myself and Alpes, and we used to have it where what we do is we would limit guys. We do what you exactly were saying, right? So you can just use your right hand. Okay. You can only use your left hand. You can only do a jab cross. You can only jab cross or can I cover, but it literally, you know, when you see two virtuosos at it and it literally was, okay, all you can do is jab. Okay, no problem. I do a jab. Oh, he does a jab cross. Next thing you know, they come into the clinch. And it was that whole thing within that first minute, they had done this progression and it was so beautiful because the thing is at any one time, you know, that these guys could unload on each other. And, but it was so skillful. It was so beautiful to watch. And it was one of those moments where you look at it and, and like, uh, you know, I know Roger Gracie does it all the time where he says, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, right? And I know this, I have this with jujitsu all the time, especially like I'm teaching a lot of no gear at the moment. I'm teaching a lot of beginners fundamentals and I have to tell them to chill out. And I keep saying to them, look, don't be the guy that people avoid. And like, and, and I went, at the moment, like as a white belt, you'll think that's a really cool thing. Oh, they're avoiding me because I'm a really hard role. And you're like, no, no, it's probably because you've got bad breath and you're shit, you know? And I, I know that sounds really bad, but it's the truth. You know, that's the whole training partner thing is, is so bizarre because I didn't really ever give it any sort of credence until I got into Jeet Kune Do. Because it was like, well, I'll just work out with whoever. And then I started realizing, you know, that if you pick the right partner, it's like Kurt was saying, you pick the right partner, five minutes with Mike Duffy, that's like an hour with anyone else. And, you know, when it's so time sensitive, it's unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very, very strange one because now it's, it's all part of taking ownership of your training. You know what I mean? That's the one thing. We're, and we all know that as we're getting older. It's that like, I don't have much time, mate. I've got two hours a week. 
guess what? I've got to work on this and this. You know what I mean? It's a very, very strange situation. Until I started going into JKD, which ironically is supposed to be this art where it's supposed to be totally and utterly personal to you. It is a journey of self-development and et cetera, et cetera. I'd never really thought about taking ownership of my own training. So I didn't really care about who I trained with. And again, in my stupid brain at the time, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I've got to make sure that this works on everybody. And it was around that era of, you know, where, um, without sounding out of order, um, remember we used to, we used to always say the martial arts was something you did with someone and combatives and fighting was something that you did to somebody. And of course, while everyone else was doing that shit, I was looking at it going, no, I want more out of this, man. So that's, luckily enough, I stumbled onto uh, JKD, which was the reason I got into martial arts in the first place, which was reading about Danny No Santo. And then um, I, it would be remiss right now to say that my first real training partner in JKD was Josh Siddiqui. It, Sid's a legend in, in JKD anyway. And he was great because he was the first guy to explain to me about how sometimes you are going to have to do a 200 mile round trip to train with somebody because they're worth the 200 mile round trip. And then obviously through that, then I started realizing that there's, you know, there's a reason why there's certain people you just have to seek out. And it was, as I said, it was a revelation for me because it was one of those moments where I was like, first of all, they haven't got all the answers. So that's the whole thing that, you know, Guru Danny No Santo and Rick Fay will tell you all the time, which is, you know, Rick Fay always says he's a good high school teacher. So he can get you to a good level at all those different arts to there, but then he wants you to go off, which is paradoxical in martial arts, especially if you're in business, because you don't want your students to go anywhere else. Jesus, man, that's the worst business model in the world ever, right? So, of course, I really, like, that really appealed to me. And of course, as I said, the ownership thing was the one that got me. But then it made me realize that I wasn't the guy that people sought out sometimes when I was training. And hopefully now I am, you know. But when I did karate, I certainly wasn't. Because I, I used to see people avoid me and I was thinking, oh, they just don't want to get a kick in this week, which might have been the fact. Or the other one is sometimes they just wanted to do a technical workout. Uh, yeah, it's a very, like, Kurt, this is a great subject you've got us into. Thanks. It's kind of one of my uh, big things that I've been contemplating a lot lately. And it's, it's funny, you know, I mean, Mick, you're one of my training partners for JKD, though we don't see each other as much as we want to. But every time we, we have a traveling thing or whatever, we always travel together and train together. And um, JKD was my first experience with that as well. And it, it, there is something, I don't know, it's cheesy, but kind of beautifully ironic, I think about the fact that it's an art that's telling you to be personal with your training, but it also is asking you to treat it like a laboratory, which means you have to surround yourself with people that you can work with so that you can have that laboratory experience. And it means you have to be somebody that people want to be around so you can have that laboratory experience. So it actually means it forces you to change your perspective into something where you go, in order for me to get better, I have to sacrifice something and help other people get better, potentially on my body, right? And that's pretty profound. That's a huge, that was a big lesson for me to realize if I've spent my whole life dreaming about developing a certain, a certain set of skills and, and what it's going to take for me to do that is to help other people get better at this. They'll help bring me along. That's very much what happened. I've always been lucky enough to train with people that are 10, 15 years, my senior and two lifetimes worth of skills better than me. Um, but because I was trying to be a good partner to them, I got access to them, you know, and that is something I try to tell my beginner students all the time, and this is exactly what you both have been talking about, is be a good training partner. That's maybe priority number one when you're in these classes, develop that perspective. Um, we've recently tried to kind of restart my school after things having fallen apart with COVID and stuff. And so we're back up and running and, and things are going pretty well. But one of the new things I'm emphasizing as a MKG martial arts school owner is what I think something our organization does really well is it teaches people how to train. Can, just for context, Rick Fay, who we, we talk about a lot on this show, is I think the only senior full instructor 
which is the highest rank you can get under Dan Nassano, who is seminar trained, who's not one of the students, his students from Guru Dance School. Why that is interesting to me is because this is a guy who had to kind of like a grateful deadhead, had to like follow Guru Dan around to all these different seminars. Then he had to go home. And the first thing he had to do was teach what he just learned to his buddies so that he would have people to train with. So that means as he was learning it as a beginner student, he also had to learn how to teach it at the same exact time, same set of priorities. And then he and those group of friends had to figure out, well, how do we train this? We don't have anyone giving us a, a set of a, a class and this is how you run a class or, or a training session, do five rounds of this, 10 minutes of that, that wasn't a thing for them. They had to kind of make that up as they went. And he has become such a world-class figure. And I think his one of his truest contributions, truest gifts to all of us is teaching people how to think like a martial artist and how to try to set up a training session. So when I get a new student in class, they're coming to me because they want to learn a martial art or whatever. But my what I hope to give them is the ability to train like a martial artist, okay? And I think that's different than practicing martial art. I think when I'm learning to play guitar, I'm practicing guitar, I'm working scales, whatever. But that's different than like developing as a songwriter, developing as a musician, right? It requires that, but it's not the same thing. And so I'm wondering, does that... Um, do you guys relate to that? And do you have maybe some input that I could help share with my students? Um, and Nathan, I'm going to look to you first. That would be like, yeah, here's things to consider where you're learning how to train like a martial artist and how to be a training partner in the martial arts, as opposed to just a fellow student on the mat one day. Yeah, it's, you both came to the same thing there, like, Mick talked about ownership of his training and you used Rick as an example of when he took ownership of his own training. Um, and then not only ownership of his own training just in what he was doing, but ownership of it to the sense that he actually created an environment around him where he could keep training and keep learning. Um, and that's exactly what you talked about, learning to be a martial artist. I think you have to sell that. I think it's a hard sell sometimes. Um I try, you know, there's little tricks and things that you say, like one of the things like, you know, holding pads, you see a lot of people disengage completely when they're holding pads. Um, you know, sometimes I try, I try and tell people there's a couple of avenues I go with. One is there's a lot of good people that are good at hitting the pads. There are not many good pad holders. It's a more difficult skill. So if you can be good at that, people, everyone will want to train with you. And it's actually, you know, you can make money out of it and things as well. But it's, I, I, I kind of push that as a rarer skill um i also push it as a separate skill i say look you know like I, especially with someone who's it's their first session i'm like oh you know i understand that i'm trying to teach you both sides how to hit a pad and hold a pad so i understand it's a bit confusing you know so, so that they don't you know they see it as actually two different skills they have to learn and it's not like oh my god it's not my go yet um but i also tell people it's a, it's a the more advanced guys i tell them it's a free go at looking at how someone throws their shots uh, and also if you can correct them you're less likely to make that pro that mistake yourself. Um, and also, like if you're holding tie pads, well, if you can't, if you don't like getting hit with a tie a tie pad on your arm, you're not going to like getting kicked, are you? So, like it'll toughen you up as well. So, I think sometimes you have to sell the side of it that you go, you know, there's benefits from it from holding pads. Um, you know, you learn more about it, and you, you're becoming a little bit of a coach, and you're also toughening yourself up, and all these kind of things. I, I, I do i think i think it's something you, you have to try to convince them of but if you do convince them of it that you, there's two different sides to it then that's being a martial artist and not just about them um there's lots of advice we give to students i'm not sure on a lot of it a lot of it shorthand like we, we've mentioned before you've said like on the you know there's a thing about leaving your ego at the door and that's said in jujitsu a lot i don't know should they like I've never met a decent fighter who didn't have a massive ego. So it depends on what your goal is. Like, you know, you have to, you know, we, they say like, you know, you either lose or you learn and all that kind of thing. And it's not about winning. And, but sometimes it is like, you know, like, you know, I've heard Bob Breen say, like, you should both be smiling and stuff in training. Yeah. Sometimes, but sometimes you should be putting it at a hammer on somebody. Like if you never do that or someone never does it to you, you never learn to deal with it. It has to be progressive. Yeah. But convincing students of this and getting them to play that role of going, this is where you're working. That's one of the other things as well, like the understanding hierarchy. I mean, what I guess we, 
one angle we could do is how to be a good student is by thinking about what makes a bad student and do the opposite of that. Because I'm pretty sure that stuff stands out a little bit more um, about not actively listening and not being, you know, being um, spoiling drills and all those kind of things. Uh, all those things when you know you see someone in the class and it's just ruining the class. I have I, I break it down at the gym to having one rule. I have one rule, and the rule is like, what if everyone did that? <laughs> Right. So if I'm talking and you're talking, I'm like, well, yeah, okay. I know you feel it's okay to do that right now, but what if everyone's doing that? Then no one's listening to me. You know, if I pull everyone in and you're sitting by the side, what if everyone did that? I'm standing here teaching some for myself. You know, like that's a basic way to kind of get students to go, like, if you all did that, are we progressing? No. Like, because I think people have a good they know they you know if they if they actually ask themselves that they know oh no actually if we all were doing that no one's progressing no one's getting better or everyone's getting injured or something like that um but advice to students to how to think like a martial artist i don't know mick give me some help here i'm floundering dude no no you're not floundering at all what you've done is you've just thrown a shitload at me to go what what am I going to do here? Because uh, I have this all the time. First of all, when I'm teaching children, I have parents and I always say to them, I've got this great anti-bullying program. And they go, what is that? I say, punch a kid in the throat. And they go, what? And I said, no, no, punch a kid in the throat. He's being a dick anyway. And they go, what? And I said, you've got to remember, this is the advice I'm going to give you all kids. Guess what? It's easier to apologize than to ask for permission. And they go, what? And then you get parents who go, wow, this is amazing. And then they all afterwards go, this is so non-PC, Mick, but it's the truth. And I'm like, look, every single kid that comes into this class and they spend more than a month with me, I will get them pretty dialed in pretty quick to go, guess what? We're all going to be warriors here. We're all scared. Yeah, we're all scared here. You know, it's not the winning, it's the taking part. That's what they say, kids. And they go, yeah. And I said, do you know who says that? And they went, who? And I went, anyone who's never won anything because winning is amazing i said kids you want to be a winner in life right yeah okay so i give them the whole really you know imagine a fat bald irish tony robbins without the earpiece that's me right so i just get them straight and i say listen kids and i explain this and when i'm saying this i'm saying it to the kids but i'm actually saying it to the parents and then i do exactly the same spiel with my beginners group, which I was going, kids, do you know what a paradox is? And they go, what, what's a paradox? I said, well, if I boil it down really, really basically, you know how Marty McFly couldn't meet himself in the past because two bodies can't exist? And they go, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went, well, that's sort of like a paradox is something that'll just make your head hurt a little bit. So guess what a paradox is? We are in this room here right now, and there's 30 of us, and I want you all to be better than me. Think about that for a second. I want you to be better than me. But at the same time, I want that to be tempered with being able to be nice to people who are worse than us. And they go, uh, 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 uh. and these are kids who get it. Kids normally get it a lot quicker than, 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 like, than adults do. Because as you were saying, Nathan, the whole thing where, you know, you've got the one guy who's up in the corner. And I always go around to him and I say, oh, what's with the existentialist angst, mate? No man is an island. What are you doing over there, mate? Come and join us. You know, come and join us, man. We're having some fun over here. So bring them all over. And I say, listen, what you have to remember is I get what you are. You're a masterless samurai. You're a ronin. You're doing martial arts. No, you're not. You're just a fucked up dude like the rest of us. We're in here to do some training and get ourselves in this sort of crazy group dynamic where we're all going to work together to become good. But guess what we're going to do? We're going to challenge each other because deep down we all want to be number one. And that is the crazy thing about martial arts, right? I have spent literally countless hours thinking about this because it's like, it is a paradox, Nathan. You, you teach someone and it's like me and you have talked about this before, Nathan. You know, when you get one of your students who's better than you and you go, it's amazing, but at the same time it sucks as well which I do, I get this all the time, but it's that whole training partner thing where it's like, I always say this, if I can make you look good, you know, Kurt will know this when it comes to Hubert, right? You can get a guy and you can make them look a million dollars on pads. You can make them look a million dollars or you can make them look shit. And as I always say, look, if I can make you look good, imagine how bad I can make you when I really want to put it on you. And that's the great thing. You know? I know that sounds savage when you say this, but if you want to be a great training partner, it's like, mate, I can make you look wonderful. 
but guess what? I can still kill you at the same time. And that is, I think for me, what the essence of being a good training partner is because you know, what you're saying about the ego, Nathan, it's ego is the reason that got them in through the door in the first place. Ego is the reason why we're still in training, mate. At 53 years of age and my next birthday, I don't need this anymore. I'm quite a charming individual. I can talk myself out of nearly anything. I can talk myself into a lot of trouble as well. I know that, right? But it's that whole mad thing. It's the good training partner. I don't even think it's a good training partner. I think what we're creating is good human beings. Kurt Cornwell. Uh, yes, I think I am an example of good human being. Great segue. Thank you. Um, no. you, you are indeed. <laughs> God, no. Um, <clears throat> so... I think for me, where, where I started with this, there's a difference between training in a martial art and practicing a martial art, right? I think um, like when you see a line of kids and or adults in a, we can say karate class or taekwondo class, they're, they're working in their lines, they're throwing punches, it's maybe part of a pattern or a form or something like that. They're kind of, I'm going to use these terms specifically, they're practicing their moves right you know and i always have people who don't do martial art be like show me one of your moves you know like we don't it, when you're not in it that's maybe something you, you say when you are we would not really think of our moves or whatever so it's practicing a pre-existing thing like practicing playing a song where for me training is like every time i throw a jab I'm thinking about the position. I'm thinking about the effect of it. I'm thinking that you're maybe thinking about something different for that whole training session. You're just thinking about the speed of retraction. You're just thinking about putting the leather on the target. You're just, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a, an objective that you're after that you're, whatever it is you're doing is in service of that objective. And that to me looks, feels, sounds a hell of a lot different than I'm practicing the three things that we're all lined up here practicing together. Um, I think with that kind of distinction in mind, you have to surround yourself with good people that they don't have to be like-minded people, but they have to be after the same uh, objective as you are. So I have some little um, things that I think are maybe good tips for beginner listeners, but Nathan, I want to get your, your feedback first. It's funny, as I was thinking about it, it came down to two things in my head, ownership and relationships. And then you kind of said them, you said about if you're on a session, if you're thinking as a martial artist, if you're training, you're not just practicing something, you're thinking about the, the punches and what you're gonna do. And then you talked about surrounding yourself with people. And you talked about how Rick, you uncreated people. And we've talked about like your, your, your relationship as a training partner, as a demo partner, all these kind of things. I think that's the, the, that, that kind of distills the difference for me the if you're just practicing it and you're not training if you're practicing you're just doing the movements and there's no self-ownership of, of what you are aiming for and goals in your journey and you don't care about the relationships or there's no relationships there's no relationship to your training partner there's no relationship to your uh the person you're training like if you're holding pads or there's no relationship to your sparring partner and your your coach and um i think the relationships are complicated and the roles and responsibilities of each one is, is is difficult. But I think that that's what it is. If you think about the person who is the martial artist, they have relationships with mentors and with coaches and with their training partners and with they have different training partners for different things. I think, I don't know if relationships is the word, but those connections and the ownership seems to be the difference. I, I don't know. That's what it kind of seems I think relationships is specifically the word. I actually like, I think, I think you're hitting the nail on the head, Mick. I mean, I, you know, I, it's, I get to have relationships with you guys because of martial art, you know what I mean? And it's the, the approach to training and the conversations about training that have brought that to fruition. If we were just practicing, if we were just practitioners of a thing, then all we would be, you know, if, if we were just all guys that practice baseball, we'd be on here talking, well, I like to swing at this kind of pitch. I like, okay, whatever. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of depth or I don't know if passion is too cheesy a word, but there's that kind of thing. One of you I mean, guys give it. Now, now you said the relationships is the thing. That's maybe almost circle round to something from before. When I said about the ego thing, and maybe ego isn't the thing because there is a time to win. And when we talk about people need to leave their ego at the door, is it about winning? Because we always connected to that. Is it, I think, 
think about the person in your class that you guard as too much ego there is that they don't respect the relationships. They don't respect the relationship with the coach. They don't respect the relationship with their training partner and what their roles and responsibilities are in those relationships. It's not that they still care about winning. It's not that. It's that they don't care about the relationships that are in the gym. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's not about caring about winning. It's about like, if you don't care that other people care about things in that room too. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, but you, you see, the thing is, Kurt, that you, you've hit on something here. Uh, we we've had this for years. Like Rick Fay, could he, uh, when I first start, when I first met you, where it, the, we didn't even have social media. Like we had emails, so we could email each other. And there was this group. There was a few of us that email. And we'd send shit. And then Rick could, Rick Fay could never get his head around the fact he was like, "But you guys only see each other for like ten days a year. How is it you, you you're straight in there and you're having these crazy conversations like?" Like you were speaking to him last week, it seems like. And I went, well, y- yeah, I was only speaking to Kurt last week. How? And Rick's like, by the way, I've got to give Rick. Wicked martial artist, probably not the most progressive guy when it comes to technology. He's still got an America Online email address. So he's like Rick Fay at AOL. I, I, I don't even think that, that CEO at AOL still got that, right? But... Uh, Rick could have worked. The only out. reason AOL still exists is because he hasn't deleted yeah, that email account. Guy. He's the one guy, right? And of course, he could never work it out because we were talking about it. We went out one night after training while he was in uh, the UK. And I said to him, Look, man, I, I don't want this to sound bad, Rick. I said, Because the martial arts itself is amazing. It is amazing. Like JKD, Carly, you know, it's got me into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well. Like everything, everything that I do in martial arts now can be traced back to the Minnesota Kylie Grove and Rick Fay, right? So it's all amazing. But as I did say to Rick, I remember we had a few beers in me and I went, you know, I'd swap all of that cool martial arts just for the friendships I've got out. I said, because it isn't the arts, man. I said, it isn't what we're training. It's the people that I'm with. It's the relationships that I've developed. Nathan Leverton, right, will tell you right now, our friendship basically blossomed over talking about Batman and comic books and i remember this like it was yesterday at the 87 center where jeff thompson was doing a seminar and at the time i hope you don't mind me saying nathan but i don't think nathan's health was that good so he was sent off to the side and i'd only literally gone in there like i'd only gone in there for a crack and somebody had mentioned nathan's name to me and uh we started chatting and then it, it, Nathan said, Oh, my name's Nathan Levitt. We were chatting. And I realized I, I, we, I don't even know how we got into the comic book thing, but we started and we spent more time talking about that than we did about martial arts. And then when Dan Hardy came to do a seminar at Nathan's, me and Dan started talking about ice hockey. And that was really, it was one of my favorite moments. So Nathan Levitt was like, hey, anyway, you got two guys who are really into martial arts, but now you just rather talk about ice hockey and rather like sh- we were shit talking about like the teams that we we supported. And I was like, mm, yeah, martial arts was just the vehicle to get me to where I needed to be. And again, it's that when you said about relationship, that, that is everything. Because when you, you, know, you, Nathan mentioned it earlier. When you get the guys, you get guys who are really, really good and they're great martial artists. But would you like, would you want to go and see, I'm going to, I'm going to make listener, dear listener, I'm shattering a few illusions here. Myself and Nathan Leverton spend more time going to the cinema, eating out, fine dining, and going to musical theatre than we do martial arts together. That is the truth. Because guess what? That, that is, uh, you don't mind me saying, Nathan, that's what we, we enjoy doing that, yeah? And the training part, we really enjoy too. But it's that, set, that, it's that, it's that other part. You know what I mean? And that, like, isn't that what training is supposed to do? You yeah, I think, where, I think where we're at now, relationships off the mats that we met through martial arts is big, as well as those relationships within. But like when you mentioned the fighters before, I think the fight, some of the fighters, they respect some relationships, like maybe a sparring partner relationship, but maybe not others so much, like always a coach um, or things like that. But, you know, you need students to re- respect all of it. Uh, and then, you know, you may not have relationships with the students off the mats. I've heard like, you know, in Japan, this, the coaches, like, don't ever hang out with the students. They have completely separate lives. There's nothing to do with them. And then I've been to gyms in America where everyone has lunch together and dinner together and everyone goes out. Um, yeah, I think those relationships off the mat 
differ place to place and in the where you are in your journey and you know gym to gym but the relationships in the gym i think that's that's an interesting one as well but yeah, specifically cut. to our point though our our topic <clears throat> i think the through line that we're talking that you're you're referencing here is it tends to be the people in martial arts this is my observation the people in martial arts that are lucky enough to have um, like deep relationship with other martial artists outside of the gym, off the mat, it's because they came from a training environment. That's the culture of the group. I, I think I see less of that in groups where they practice martial art together than I do in people who train in the martial arts together. Again, to, to our point, you know, it's the fact that there is a like, um, a cooperative a, a experience, a shared experience that's happening in a training session with training partners, as opposed to a group practice session, you are asking something from the other person. You know, if, if you're holding pads for me <clears throat> and you're correcting things as I'm going, this might be the thing that does give my ego a little bit of a boost. You know, if, if you're somebody who struggles with some self-confidence issues or whatever, and you're taking up martial art to develop some of that stuff, I don't, I'm not saying I'm speaking from experience, but, but so you're, this is your thing that kind of gives you some sense of power. Now you've got somebody else that's going, Hey, you're not very good at this. When you do it, that can, that can be difficult, you know? So you have to trust that other person who's helping you that they are in fact helping you, that they're telling you this for your benefit, you know, and, and that this is in service of you taking that, that uh, powerful role, you taking ownership of that thing. And so definitely you want to grab a beer with that person. Definitely you want to have a sandwich or go to musical theater or whatever the hell it is you do with that person, because you just kind of let them read your diary for the last 90 minutes during this training session. You know what I mean? They, they, they know everything that you were dealing with today. You can tell that's, that's how it is when you train with another person, instead of just practicing a skill with another person, it requires, I'll use the word intimacy, a certain kind of intimacy with that person. Um, and I, I love that, that I feel extremely lucky that I've been able to develop so many meaningful friendships through martial art. And I feel for the people that I watch and I can see them, they're like, why, why don't I have that? I'm also in martial art. How come I don't have a bunch of martial art friends? You know, uh, how come even in this room full of weirdos, I'm still the odd person out. And a lot of that is isolation. A lot of that is being the person sitting in the corner, you know, and uh, I should take a page out of your guys' book. And when I see that, make sure I, I make an effort to include them and, you know, get them uh, at the table, as it were. Uh, you, you just you just said something there um, that Rick Fay used to always say, because uh, obviously Rick's one of those guys that uh, he's, he's told me loads of times he would love to be a, he'd love to be a, a construction worker or something or build something. And I was like, why? And he says, just that, you know, that shared labor, you know, he said, when you, when you came back from camp, we, because we'd been through something together and I said it to him, like I blew his mind a little bit. Cause I was like that, but you do build something, Rick, you're building a load of humans. Cause guess what? You had all these oddballs. I said, dude, Think about this. I, I've spent a shitload of money and traveled six and a half thousand miles to come here. And I'm quite an outgoing guy. And I said, why? Because it was everything that else, you know, it was the, um, it's the fact that you, you, you're creating something together. And again, that's, I think, you know, isn't that it? like Kurt bringing it right back to where you started a good training partner, you're getting two people to work together. And it's like you were saying, practicing or doing it but you're doing something together with there's the crazy thing of this could end very badly or it could be amazing. And uh, we're, we're going to take a risk here. And you know yourself, you'll take the risk once or twice, but you won't do it every week. And I think that boils down to why you pick the training partner, because I don't know about you, man, if I go there and I think I'm just going to be taking a lottery ticket every time I'm walking through the door, no chance and that and that is that is the beauty of martial arts because you, you walk in one day sometimes it's just hey how long did it take for me and you to you know key in together Kurt? right right hours well and Next you know months, this is this is true for 
uh, any kind of physical intimacy you seek out from another person's body, right? You know, there's times where you're like, you know, I, I maybe don't even care so much who it is. I'm just here to bang, you know, I'm just here to, I'm just here to get after it, you know? And, but then you meet that special someone and you're like, yeah, but it's just different from with them. You know, it just feels right. And, and, you know, I was thinking of like my training partner, Steph, the reason I just thought of the correlation is there would be times where I'd be like, I kind of like it when Steph hurts me, you know, I don't like being hurt <laughs> generally speaking, but when he does it or Mick, you're that way too. And like, nice. Yeah. Good job. You know, and uh, there's, there's correlations there to other parts of our uh, physical intimacy lives as well, I guess. But um so to be, you know, if you want more people to uh, pick you for physical intimacy, um, then you, you got to you have to be, you know, trustworthy. You have to be somebody who the other people in the room know that you genuinely do want them to uh, to have a good time. Right. You genuinely do care about their success with this thing. Um, I think maybe we can finish this where maybe we should have started. It's just some practical tips for being a good training partner. Um, I think maybe we can go around and just give a couple, but to start us off, um, I think one, show up, right? Show up as much as you can. And on the days you don't want to, show up twice. Um, try to be on time, which I am not always very good with, but try to be on time. Um, don't, you know, show up clean. These are obvious things, but, but they genuinely, if you're like, you know, I wanna be a better training partner, show up often, show up on time, show up with good breath. Um, and there's always going to be the person who's so excited to hold pads because they want to teach or coach the other student that they're working with. And that becomes an ego thing, right? They want to kind of show the other person how much they know. You guys have to have had this experience when you go to another school and you wind up training with somebody and they don't know who you are. And so they're telling you every single thing they've ever learned about the jab when you're there throwing it or whatever. And they're over coaching you and you're like, yeah, I'm just trying to be polite. You're nodding along, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm aware, you know? Um, so I think train with your partner and understand what their goals are, but don't over coach them. You know, we're fortunate to have expressions that we can keep in our back pocket, like creating an environment where information reveals itself, you know, try to facilitate that with your training partner, as opposed to just telling them everything you think they should do, which is really going to just be subjective to, to who you are, what your interests are. Nathan, I'm sure you've always been a good training partner because I know the kind of coach and kind of person you are. We've never trained together, but I absolutely, beyond a doubt, know you'd be a, a fantastic training partner. What do you think is one, maybe two things about you or rather that you've learned that would make somebody a good partner? I mean, after what you said, as a coach, I think I'm going to tell my students now, if they're a bad training partner, it's obvious that they're a bad liver. So, um, just to kind of get everyone on board, I mean, that, 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 that kind of makes sense now. Um, and now you, that you said that I'm a good, I'd be a good training partner and you can see that. I mean, I, I'm going to take that as a massive compliment. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, every, <laughs> everything you've said about, yeah, you're being consistent, turning up, um, making sure that you're both having, you know, a good time with it. Um, I, I like what you said about not overcoaching and I usually tell people, oh, earn the right to ask a question and show it. So if you're not the best in the room at it, then just focus on doing that until if you're the best in the room, then ask me a question about something else. Like, you know, ask me, you know, do you move on to the next thing? If you're not, then why isn't your goal to be the best in the room? So kind of like, you know, do what the teacher has said and earn the right by being better at it to move on to something else. Don't just move on because you saw it on YouTube that day. Um, that would be one of the big things like the distraction. People get distracted very easily. Uh, with distraction, like with meditation, I often try and tell people that you will get distracted. Every time you come back to what you were supposed to be thinking about, back to what you were doing, that's a repetition. So like make that the repetition of coming back if you start to get sidelined. Um, but uh, I think you covered a lot of it. Mick, you got any advice? It's at this moment here that I really, after 38 years of doing martial arts, I really want to, you know, I want to quote maybe Musashi, maybe the book, yeah, the book of five rings, maybe the art of war by Sun Tzu. Uh, but I'm going to have to actually quote a friend of mine, Russell Jarmusty, who just says, don't be a dick. 
Like that's literally, he's, but that's his advice in martial arts and in life in general. Um, yeah, my my two my two co co presenters here succinctly put it. You know, the whole great like there's all these things that you should avoid, but deep down, basically, when you go in there, it's like, you know, uh, don't be a dick. By the way, it's an umbrella term that covers everything that you guys have already said. You know, I've had this. You know, the, 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 and this will be how we will wrap this up. We all can learn from someone. But sometimes, you know, you just got to realize, have you got anything to teach? Like there's a classic line where Guru Dan in Osanto, a drunkard, came into the academy and started like, I don't know if you ever heard this, Kurt, where he started moving around. And because the guys were all training and he went, you're doing it all wrong. You're doing it all wrong. And he walked into Dan in Osanto's gym. He went, you're doing it all wrong. And they were ready to throw him out. And the late Larry Hartzell was there. And like, imagine that guy throwing you out. And he's about to throw him out. And Guru's like, no, 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 he's right. We're doing it all wrong. And it, because what, what we were doing, they were doing a drip. And instead of a step and slide, it should have been a slide and a step. And he said, the guy's got a point. And it was at that point you turn around and you look at it, you go, this is like arguably a better martial artist, in my opinion, than Bruce Lee. Easily a visionary. This was Dan Inosanto prepared to be the best training partner or student, should we say, ever. Because this is a drunkard who walked in off the street and just, you're doing it all wrong. And whether or not the guy was right or wrong, that is that doesn't make any difference. The fact that he was able to question what he thought was the way, man, come on, think about that. That's amazing. Don't be a dick. It's as simple as that. That's the only advice I would give you. And if you are being a dick, try to be less of a dick because unfortunately that there's a sliding scale to dickness. Uh, I know this because, you know, I, I, I have been that guy. All right. But that's it. I think we're going to wrap up here. And I can't believe that you guys. Yeah, Mick, I'll give this. you a, a real heady philosophical quote that's in line with what you're saying. So tell uh, me. It's some Ram Dass used to say, which is uh, when you know how to listen, everybody is the guru. Right. And it, that to me was a transformative thing to hear as a martial artist where it's just true. If you if you know how to quiet down, shut up and pay attention, you're going to learn something. Wow. And I think as martial artists and good training partners, that's a good thing to always keep in our back pocket to keep the room moving forward. Um, Nathan, as you said, uh, it, it a lot of it is really it's about the we, not the me part of it. And I think, um, you know, if, if we can keep that in mind, people are going to be seeking out to to keep training, keep things progressing. Thanks guys for jumping in this topic with me. Um, I was really, really interested in getting your feedback on it. And boy, am I glad I brought it up. Fantastic. Sports Social Podcast Network. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.